afternoon and welcome to this session that we have on financing a green transition and reaching net zero, the role of long-term strategies on market developments. We are co-hosting this with the International Energy Agency and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. My name is Margaret Anne Blon. I'm the Executive Director of the Climate Markets and Investment Association. We are a nonprofit trade association um, aiming to lead a global coalition of private sector actors uh, to enable the trillions into a uh, climate resilient, low carbon, sustainable economy. Today, we are delighted to have Daniel uh, Violette, who is the senior manager, uh, senior director of the programs coordination and director of the means of implementation division at the UNFCCC. Um, as senior director, please I'll invite you up. As senior director, he provides strategic direction and oversight in relation to the work of the program department comprised of four programs, which is adaptation, means of implementation, mitigation, and transparency. Um, Daniele ensures strategic, <coughs> substantive, and administrative coherence and synergy in the delivery of their work programs, including in relation to the established intergovernmental processes and constituted bodies. Prior to his current position, he served as Chief of Staff of the Secretariat for seven years, supporting two executive secretaries. He was also coordinator for the United Nations Secretary General's high-level advisory group on climate change financing at the United Nations headquarters in New York. Daniele, we are delighted to have you here today. Thank you so much for opening this session. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. And thanks to organizers for having the Climate Change Secretariat joining you today. And, uh, and really the topic of this discussion is quite, quite critical uh, since as we, we see the negotiation uh, around us now proceeding to the final uh, stages, uh, uh, it's, it's really always helpful to take a step back and, and use uh, the opportunities of events like this one to explore the strategic action we can take collectively to realize the goal of the Paris Agreement uh, between government, finances, investors, the private sector, and civil society. I believe it's worth to recall Article 4, um, Para 9 of the Paris Agreement uh, states that uh, all parties should strive to formulate and communicate long-term low greenhouse gas emission development strategies with the goal of the Paris Agreement in mind take into account their common but differentiated responsibility and respective capabilities. So in the six years since uh, Paris, uh, much of the focus, uh, and, and we believe uh, rightly so, has been on the development of updates to nationally determined contribution. So the, the government plans that set out targets over five to 10 years. Um, we, at the Secretary, we have uh, recently issued another version of our uh, a summary report of the NDCs, uh, and uh, the, the numbers, uh, unfortunately, are not yet there for where we need to be if you want to meet the goals of the Paris Agreements. However, long-term strategies um, have, by comparison, received uh, also less attention, but it is equally important to take a long-term perspective to the transformation that is required. So in the, in the wake of the pandemic, uh, uh, short term is as understandably gripped governments in their response to the health, social, economic challenges they have faced throughout the world in, in this period. Uh, uh, and short term is, is also a hallmark of financial markets in, in corporation boardrooms. Nevertheless, uh, uh, businesses, investors need long-term signal from governments that underpin technological and economic change over decades. And uh, what makes the right investment decision today is the long-term vision needed to support the decision-making. Uh, of course, reward goes for movers and bring forward the widespread adoption in, in quick time frames. A lot of work needs to be done. Um, a few numbers indicating that 137 countries um, representing 90% of global GDP and 88% of emissions have announced net zero targets. Uh, according to the net zero tracker. And, and therefore, and also in a, uh, following analysis of IEA, uh, so this may really help us to be on the path below two degrees. So a lot of work to be done in using this long-term strategy to flesh out these net zero targets uh, and provide the necessary signals for wall of government from top to bottom and the private sector to take action. 
42 parties have submitted long-term strategies to date, six already since the start of this COP. So the momentum is there. And, and in closing, the role of MDBs uh, in particular in supporting the development implementation of long-term strategies in developing countries and backing them up with early stage financing, partnership with private sector, extensive policy dialogues and strong country ownership will be crucial and critical to make sure that the implementation takes place. So we all need country and sector level success stories to proliferate as quickly as possible so that these pledges can turn into strategies and strategies can turn into investment decisions today that help us realize the future we want. So I wish you a good discussion today and thanks again for having the Climate Change Secretary with you today. Thank you very oh, much, Margaret. Over to you. Thank you so much, Daniele, for joining us. We really appreciate that. Um, and next we have a special guest speaker as well. Um, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Bertrand Picard, if you'd like to come up and, and join the stage. Um, Bertrand Picard, with his dual identity as a medical doctor and an explorer, has become really an influential voice heard among the most distinguished institutions across the globe as a forward-thinking leader in progress and sustainability. He's, he's independent, he's not associated with any particular party or lobbying group, um, and as such, he's really a trusted advisor and influencer for the development of new social solutions and, a, and really a very sought after speaker for public and private audiences, which is one of the reasons we're delighted. Um, it's in Bertrand's DNA to go beyond the obvious and achieve really the impossible. He's did this through two uh, round the world flights, recently in a solar powered airplane and before that in a nonstop balloon. Um, I had the opportunity of first seeing um, Bertrand at uh, COP in the COP 20, uh, was it COP 22 in Marrakesh? He's a wonderful speaker, and we were talking just before the session about the difference, uh, what uh, you know, six, uh, five, six years has made. But um, people don't necessarily want to hear me; they certainly want to hear you, Bertrand. And please, we well, thank you so much for opening up and and providing a keynote to us. Thank you for your kind introduction, and good afternoon to everyone. If you were the CEO of a big corporation who is employing thousands of people and making business the same way since 50 years, what would you think today? What would you do today? And how would you run your business? And I think this is exactly the question we have to ask to ourselves when we are taking measures for the environment. Because if we come to see these CEOs and we say, we must protect the environment, they're probably going to tell, yes, we know that we have to do something, but we don't know how to do it. And we're afraid of all the changes, and we're afraid of the distortion of competitivity with other companies. We need a fair play field. And this is what we need to give to these CEOs. We need to give the certainties for the future. We need to show exactly how things are going to move in order not only to help them to adapt their company to the changes, but also to reassure them that they will be able to do it. And the legal framework in that sense is extremely important. It's interesting to see that we signed an op-ed with 16 big CEOs of international companies together with my Solar Impulse Foundation. And what were they asking for? They were asking for strong ecological regulations, but the same for everyone. They were asking for a CO2 price, the same for everyone, in order to be able to make the change without being detrimental to their business and to their corporations. And it's also our own interest to help them to do this diversification. Because it is a danger, a real danger for our society if we have big corporations who collapse. These corporations are employing thousands of people and we are always speaking at the COP about a just transition. 
which means that we have to take care of the people who are employed. We cannot leave them behind. So we see how important it is to have a reconciliation between the industry and the ecology. And this is exactly the work I have done since I announced in Marrakesh at COP22 the goal of identifying solutions that could protect the environment in a financially profitable way. I announced in Marrakesh when you were there, I would identify a thousand of them. And people thought, wow, this will be impossible. Today, not only we found a thousand, but we found a thousand three hundred of them. Systems, products, materials, uh, uh, sources of energy, technologies, devices, who exist today, not making us wait for the future, but allowing us to act today, profitable today, an ecological today in that sense that they can protect the environment. And I think the fact that so many solutions exist can allow the governments to be ambitious in the commitments. Because if the norms, the standards, everything that is dealing with ecology is completely laid back, it will never push the industry to change. It will never push the consumers to change. And today, it's exactly what we see. We have NGOs who accuse big corporations of polluting. And what are the corporations answering? What we do is legal. So, of course, we have to modernize the legal framework. If the norms and the standards for emissions, for pollution, for efficiency, for consumption, for waste, are really tough, but tough for everyone, it will oblige to pull on the market all these new systems that exist. And these systems, if they are not pulled to the market by tough regulations, they will remain in the startups who will go bankrupt or remain in the research labs for scientists and not to be used by all the people who need them. So we see that it is useless to push innovation with grants and subsidies and so on. Or maybe not really useless, but not enough. What we need is to pull all these systems to the market by creating a need for them. And this will wake up all the industry because they will know that there are tools they can use to fulfill the new regulations. And this is a message that has to be pushed really strong. A regulation is not just something that bothers people. A regulation is something that can change the use of the systems and the technologies to finally bring us to be much more efficient than we were before and stop to waste three quarters of the energy that is produced either by wrong behaviors or by completely inefficient and outdated systems and infrastructures as we have today. And if you notice, we can extend exactly the same theory to the developing and emerging economies who are afraid that ambitious NDCs taken on their side would be detrimental for their national economy. And maybe this is why there is so much resistance in some of the negotiations at the COP. And it's vital to have a success in such international negotiations to show all the advantage, all the options, all the opportunities that can bring their countries to increase their economical development at the same time than reducing their emissions. Today, you can decouple GDP and emissions of CO2. You can decouple the GDP from the quantity of the consumption in order to link it to the quality of the efficiency. The technology allows it today. This is why the only way, I would say, to help emerging countries <coughs> to have an economical development is to bring efficiency, ecology, and climate change fight and mitigation at the heart of the economical development. To use sources of energies that are cheaper, solutions that save energy, 
circular economy, waste management, new type of saving resources, all this is the business of tomorrow, but also the business of today. So all the development aid, all these thousand, or let's say these hundred billion that have to be given every year, of course there is a part for adaptation, but there is a part for investment. And these investments are not cost. The cost is when you lose the money. The investment is when you put money somewhere and you get more money back. And these investments are going to be extremely valuable for the countries who can leapfrog their development, achieve a lot, and pollute much less. So we see that all the stars are in the right constellation, but we have to change the narrative. If we continue to say that fighting climate change is something expensive and sacrificial, it will not work. If we show that it is profitable and exciting, we'll create much more momentum. And this is really what I hope that the participants at COP26 and the following COPs will understand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, Bertrand Picard. You're an inspiration. Um, how wonderful to see you here. Thank you for enjoying us. And we, we hope you, the audience, really have, have enjoyed this too. Um, I, I find the energy infectious. I find the narrative uh, inspiring. And, you know, it makes us want to, to discover new ways of doing and, and thinking, in particular in the field of clean technologies for, for a better quality of life. And, and here we are um, six years later at COP26 in Glasgow, six years after the Paris Agreement. Uh, hopeful for an updated, more ambitious agreement and, and that the Paris rulebook will be finalized. Some of you joining us today have been to several COPs and for others, this will be the first time you attend one or you might be joining us remotely. Wherever you are, uh, welcome. Welcome here and, and I need to announce, and I should have announced this first, that um, there is Russian interpretation services that are available in this session for those in the room. Channel 3 is for English, Channel 5 is for Russian, um, and hopefully the channel allocation applies to both in the virtual uh, setting as well. Um, as I mentioned, we're the co-hosts with uh, the IEA and the EBRD uh, on this session, and, and this is really what I enjoy most about COPS, because it's this mix of organizations coming together to discuss ways to get to a better place. Um, the IEA is an intergovernmental uh, organization and works with countries around the world to shape energy policies for a secure and sustainable world. And the EBRD is a, a multilateral development bank that uses investment to further progress towards market-oriented economies and promotion of private and entrepreneurial initiatives. Now, CMIA, what we represent is really the voice of the private sector, and our membership is 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 broad uh, across a variety of sectors and industries. Um, it's comprised of leading companies in their respective fields, uh, yet varied from impact investors to low carbon project developers. We've got technical advisors, financial specialists, and, and lawyers, just to give you an idea of what we're about. And the association is really united by people who are invested in solving the climate emergency. And what we do is we provide a safe space for public and private sector to discuss and take action. We're approached when governments or organizations want to discuss and find out what's workable, bankable, and scalable. Now, engagement and coordination between government and business is critical for advancement on climate issues, and, and we facilitate this on several platforms, sometimes either direct or bilaterally, but some of this dialogue takes place um, at two of the world's largest climate funds. We represent the private sector at the Climate Investment Funds, which is a uh, held in trust at the World Bank and also at the UN Green Climate Fund, which is an operating entity of the financial mechanism of the convention. And what this means is that we provide private sector expertise and insight to the boards of these funds for their decision making. So moderating this today is uh, great because we've got government, we've got the multilateral development banks and the private sector here. Uh, what I'd like to do is introduce the panel and then we'll, we'll just dive right in. We've got Harry Boyd Carpenter who, uh, joining us remotely, who is the Managing Director of the Green Economy and Climate Action at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. He took up this role in April 2021. 
Um, Harry is responsible for coordinating the EBRD's work across the green economy and climate agendas with the overall goal of meeting the bank's commitment to achieve a green finance ratio of over 50% of annual investments by 2025. He leads a team that drives climate and green financing policy and analysis across all economic sectors and financing instruments, as well as representing the EBRD and climate forums. We've also got to my right here, Mary Birch Wallach, uh, is the Deputy Executive Director of the International a Energy Agency. Um, Mary is a retired career diplomat and former U.S. Ambassador to Serbia. Um, Mary has held a variety of senior leadership positions at the U.S. Department of State. National Security Council and Department of Defense serving in Washington and abroad. Thank you so much for joining us, Mary. We've got uh, to the right uh, further we'll go, Carl Upston Hooper from Camco Clean Energy, which is a climate and impact fund manager leading the, glean, the clean energy transition in emerging markets. Uh, Carl is based in Camco's Finnish office in Helsinki and is responsible for management of legal risk, corporate governance and compliance within the company. Um, Camco is also responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the Renewable Energy Platform, our REPP program, uh, which Carl has worked on since inception in 2014. And REP has recently been named the winner of the Transformative Financial Solutions Impact Investing Award uh, at this year's Financial Times and IFC Transformational Business Awards. Camco is also a member of CMIA and an international accredited entity or delivery partner at the Green Climate Fund. And to my left, we've got Anur uh, Kopayeva, who is the Deputy Director of the Climate Policy and Green Technologies Department at the Ministry of Ecology, Geology, and Natural Resources of the Republic of Kazakhstan. Anur uh, works on the, uh, it works on cooperation with international financial institutions and organizations for the implementation of climate change projects. Since 2019, uh, Anur is a technical coordination a coordinator for cooperation with the Green Climate Fund. She's a participant of Kazakhstan's delegation at the COP for over the last three COPs. Thank you so much for joining us here today. So let's dive right in. And Mary, I'd really like to start with you. Could you um, share with us what, what must countries and investors do to make sure that we keep the door open to a net zero future? Well, thank you um, very much, Margaret Ann. I'm really delighted to be here, and I just want to start off by thanking you, CMIA and EBRD, for joining us in hosting this um, event today. It's really an important subject, the subject related to financing um, the green energy transition and uh, reaching net zero and really thinking hard about how we how we get there. I want to thank everyone um, who is also joining us um, here and around the world um, in, in this discussion today. Um, I want to focus in my remarks very specifically on the energy sector, which is responsible for uh, about three quarters of greenhouse gas emissions. And so for that reason, this, is, uh, this has very much been a strong focus of the International Energy Agency, especially uh, over the past year or more. Um, we issued, um, we've issued a number of publications that really look hard at this issue. Um, that have provided a roadmap on um, how to reach net zero emissions by 2050. So really encourage all of you to take a look at our website if you haven't uh, come across some of these reports already. Um, we also issued earlier this year a, a report very specifically on the question of financing uh, the energy transition in um, emerging and developing economies, which is a, a really, um, really a major um, uh, important um, challenge that we must must be be addressing in a in a more meaningful um, way what we show in these reports is that staying on track with 1.5 degree scenario um, involves shifting to really a completely new energy economy um, this with a surge in annual investment in clean energy to around four trillion by 2030 um, this is up from less than one trillion today. So there's a huge, huge challenge that lies ahead in the financing area. Um, and most of this growth comes from, um, as I just uh, referred to, the emerging and developing economies where there needs to be a dramatic scale up of private capital uh, to fund 60% of clean investments by 2030. So um, what we need really is a major reallocation of financial flows um, to two areas that are underserved, underserved today, to clean energy in general. So across the world, a significant scale up in clean en renewables and clean energy 
investments and to emerging and developing economies in particular. Um, but in the World Energy Outlook, which we issued just a couple of weeks ago, um, intentionally um, launched um, prior to the COP, we looked at all the pledges to date, and we show that even if implemented on time and in full, um, they only address 20% of the gap in emissions reduction that needs to be um, closed by 2030 to keep the door open to reach net zero by 2050. So while the ambition, uh, the high ambition is very welcome and uh, we um, continue to urge even greater ambition, what's even more important in the near, near term is the action and implementation and keeping an eye very, very actively on how to, to move the needle. There's a risk that this delayed near-term near action will put the net zero emissions by 2050 scenario out of reach. So this is a real concern, um, leaving us with too much to do after 2030 with too high of uh, locked-in emissions and, and with too little progress in innovation and in clean energy technologies, which needs to be a major focus as, all, as well. The good news is that we have the policies and technologies um, to close this ambition gap and a substantial share of the necessary emissions reductions come from cost-effective and well-understood technology measures. So here, here's what we need to do. On the public side, we really need to redouble international support by providing international catalysts for clean energy investment starting with the commitment by advanced economies already made to mobilize at least $100 billion in clean finance, though I mentioned the um, ambition that real goal needs to be much higher. Um, second, we, we need to reinforce the mandate of international public finance institutions. I know we're going to hear from our EBRD colleagues uh, shortly, but they continue to play a really important role um, in supporting clean energy investment, um, uh, providing the catalyst, the boost, the drive to improve the delivery of funds and also uh, to help with blended finance and to help um, move private capital in the right directions as well. Um, and we really need to accelerate the emissions reductions from uh, existing unabated coal assets, which I know has been a, a huge subject of discussion here at COP. And on the private side, there's a, a great deal to be done at all, mobilizing the huge wealth in global capital markets is ultimately critical to funding clean energy transitions. Um, and the code, uh, the role of the private sector as a provider of climate finance is called to grow, very much so. So international sustainable finance efforts sh should really focus hard on ways to identify, to incentivize investors, to, to lay the right uh, policy environment that will attract them. Uh, to fund a much broader range of clean energy investment opportunities, um, especially in emerging uh, and developing economies. So we recognize the challenge is huge, um, but it's quite clear um, um, what, the, what the goals are that we need to achieve. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, we've got the takeaways. I loved how you offered the, um, what the public sector should do what uh, the reinforce the mandates of the MDBs and also um, finishing with the private sector, how it really can, can grow on, uh, to help deliver on, on climate finance. Um, so let's lead then with the private sector, actually. Carl, how uh, can long-term strategies inform market developments by, by the private sector to achieve net zero emissions? Thank you, Margaret Ann. Um, yeah, I guess Camco Clean Energy is the, the pointy end of the spear here because we are actually financing uh, renewable energy projects in emerging developing countries, that's, that's our business. Um, and I guess the other introductory remark I'd like to make is that we of course as a company are very firmly committed to net zero by 2050 as uh, part of the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative, uh, along with 57 trillion of other assets under management. But to deconstruct the question, um, I think we're asking sort of what, what does the private sector need or what's the environment to increase private sector ambition and investment. Uh, and to me that's three things. Um, it's clarity of, of investment direction, and I feel we, you know, we have that. I think the entire world knows which direction we're going here. Uh, we have that from uh, the Paris targets, we have that from the NDCs, we have that from Article 4 and the long-term strategies, we have that from carbon pricing. Businesses or investors also need to be able to match risk and return. Um, that's effectively an information problem, and perhaps we can discuss 
more about that uh, later. But thirdly, we need to remove the barriers that are preventing investment, uh, particularly in the developing world. Uh, and I feel that this is where the subject of today's panel, the, the long-term strategies, is really key. Uh, because the long-term strategy is a process. It's not a, it's not a document. I mean, yes, there are 44 documents that have been submitted to the UNFCCC. Um, sadly, only one of them is from an African country, from South Africa. Um, but it should be a process. And the MDB principles on the long-term strategies uh, note that that process should uh, reflect the deep systemic transformation that needs to occur in order to get to net zero by mid-century. And it's that deep systemic transformation that I would like to focus on from a private sector perspective in terms of removing these, these barriers. Because uh, as somebody who does this for a day job, there are a lot of difficulties in making investments in much of the developing world. Um, there are foreign exchange control problems. There are kind of poor regulatory frameworks or uncertainty around regulatory frameworks. There are regulatory capacity problems. Even though some of the NDAs that we work with for the GCF are some of the most committed people you'll find, maybe their offices are not as resourced to address uh, these things as they could be. Um, and then there's also the kind of uh, integration of net zero goals away from just the energy sector into transport and agriculture, water, these other uh, very significant um, uh, emission sources. Uh, and, you know, what I love about Article 4, if somebody can love an article of the Paris Agreement, um, is, is that uh, it strikes me as it's a gateway in which we can get on with this very difficult job of transforming not just what our target's going to be or whether we have carbon pricing, but this deep systemic structural reform that is going to have to occur in a lot of these places uh, if we're going to get the levels of, of, of private investment that, that we're seeking. So perhaps I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Carl. Um, yeah, we, the, we talk about the barriers, and especially when we work at, at the Green Climate Fund with all of these different um, different policy frameworks, different challenges that countries face. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to move next to Harry, who is joining us remotely. Um, Harry, oh, yes, he is there. Great. Harry, thank you so much for joining us. Nice to see you. Um, Harry, I, I've got a question for you with regards to what role do, does long-term strategies uh, play in Paris Alignment investment appraisals by the multilateral development banks? Thank you very much, Margaret, and um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, and uh, I'd particularly like to, like to thank uh, Dr. Violetti, who's been uh, the trem tremendous support for the role of multilaterals in, in, in this process. Um, just responding to your comment, I mean, what, what's the, your question? What's the, the context of that question? Well, the context, of course, is that we, like many other multilateral development banks, have committed that within the next couple of years, in our case, um, by the end of next year, all of our operations will be aligned with the, the goals of the Paris Agreement. And that's us giving effect to a commitment within the Paris Agreement itself that financial flows need to be aligned with, with its goals. And that really, really matters um, because it's about two things, really. One is leveraging all of our money or putting all of our money into channels which are Paris, alignment, Paris aligned, con uh, consistent with the long-term temperature goals. But it's also about leveraging that, leveraging the flow of our money to try to influence the businesses we invest in, the, the, the banks that we support. Um, so Paris Alignment for us has, has two very important dimensions. Firstly, making sure that our money is going to the right directions, but also trying to have a multiplier, have a systemic effect um, by driving through that process the, the, the business models and the financial flows of our investees. Um, so Paris Alignment sounds really technical. Uh, it is really technical. Um, I can tell you it's a pretty complicated, pretty um, difficult business that we're, that we're getting to grips with right now. But it's really, really important. What's the role of a long-term strategy for us? Well, if, frankly, it's the gold standard. Um, if we have a really good long-term strategy in place, it allows us to be comfortable that an investment that fits within that strategy is indeed Paris Aligned. Um, a lot of times, as, as, as you mentioned, I think, in your introduction, that you know, we, we don't always have, a lot of countries don't yet have long-term strategies. Um, and when they don't, we're developing a whole set of other tools. So we're looking for ourselves to try to understand, is this a type of activity that causes a high level of risk? Um, if it is, are there, can, we, can we see a, a pathway that 
we uh, identify ourselves or that a regional body is identified or something like that. Um, but all of those are second best models because the best thing for us is when a country that we're trading in has designed for itself its own route map um, to, to get to the net zero goal. Where we have that in place, then we have something we can test a project against and, we're, and we can have a high degree of confidence that the projects are Paris aligned. Why does that matter so much? Well, what really is important about that is it allows us to invest more and it allows us to invest in particular in the difficult projects. If we come and look at a wind farm, we can be pretty confident that a wind farm is Paris aligned with or without a long-term strategy. And that's fine, but there's a whole set of investments out there that we know need to be made. And we know that we're in a transitional phase and that there are sectors we need to invest in. Transport is one, uh, the district heating sector, uh, I know from Kazakhstan is here and she will know very well that the challenges around district heating in, in, in cold countries. You know, these are sectors where we have big challenges. Um, we know we have to make big steps forward, but we also know that there are not always obvious zero carbon solutions that we can deploy right now. And that's where we find real difficulties because we, in making those transitional investments, it's a very hard job to distinguish between the ones that are genuinely transitional and genuinely moving a country towards a low carbon goal and ones that are not and ones that are, that are locking in low, uh, high carbon infrastructure. So the great thing for us about a long term strategy is that it helps with those difficult investments. It gives us a roadmap that allows us to really move in the areas which are most difficult, most demanding, but also potentially the most important. So I think that's a critical role. And I'd probably I'd just go on and say one or two more other important things about long-term strategy. It, Dr. Picard mentioned the, the pull factor. Uh, and I think that's really, really important because we see a lot and we hear a lot now about the appetite for green investments, about the capital available to invest in, in green uh, projects. But what's really important is that those projects are commercially viable. And you need an economic structure, you need frameworks in the economic structure which make projects, make low carbon projects economically viable, that make them commercially attractive. That pull factor that's pulling money in rather than just pushing up the supply of money. And, and I think that's the other key element for us around the long term strategy is that it creates the enabling environment, it allows a business to say, it makes sense for me to do this low carbon investment because this is the way this economy is going. Um, it makes sense for me to shift my business off this model onto a new model because I can see that the direction of travel for this economy is to a low carbon future. And I think that's a really important point because a, a long term strategy can help shift the, the discourse away from seeing a low carbon transition as a burden and as a cost and towards seeing it as an opportunity, towards seeing it as a, as a definition of so many new economic activities, so many new forms of investment um, that an economy can so to answer your question, in summary, those are the two critical roles. One is that it gives us a, a, a very clear roadmap about, about what investments we can make and, and which we shouldn't make, in particular in the difficult sectors. And the other is that it creates an environment which stimulates investment, which gives a roadmap and, and, and creates this demand for low carbon investments. Thank you so much, Harry. You really um, laid that out very clearly. I appreciate that and uh, particularly appreciate and talk about this economic viability because at the end of the day it has to make sense and for the private sector to be to crowd in so knowing that uh, what i'd like to do is move to anur and, and talk about knowing what um harry has set out that that we these long-term strategies then allow this direction of travel um how do we make sure then that governments um adopt ambitious long-term strategies i'd love to hear your your thoughts. Thank you, Maria. I will be speaking uh, Russian. Si. Yeah. Okay. Это довольно непростой момент именно повышение амбиций. Complicated uh, issue. Scaling up investment. I work in the Ministry for Ecology, and we uh, do a lot of preparation, preparatory work, to work with all the parties involved to inform the society in general, businesses, the state and government bodies about how the changes in climate act and influence our country and other regions in the world. We conduct a lot of work 
to ensure that, that the sectors of economy that produce most of the greenhouse gases are known. Uh, we work with the Ministry for Energy, Ministry for Transport, Agriculture, as well as the national uh, bodies of entrepreneurs that the information that we have is known to them and influences their decision as well and how vulnerable we will be in future if we don't take action and using these instruments we make sure that all the interested parties are informed about the importance of reducing the greenhouse gases. We also inform our partners about our long-term strategies and also tell them where we will be if we don't take action, again, in 10, 15 years. We work with international bodies, like, for example, in Kazakhstan, we uh, work on the long-term strategy up to 2060 uh, to achieve um, carbon neutrality. This work took us nearly six years, and with the support of the government of Germany, where the experts helped us a lot to develop the scenario uh, for carbon neutrality for Kazakhstan. This work nearly, is nearly finished, and I can assure you that this work has been done using the state-of-the-art modeling techniques, and the main outcome of that work is the instruments with which we can reduce the greenhouse um, gas emissions, and also the key factors which affect our agriculture and how things will change if the gas and oil prices will change and what effect it will have on our economy. We also take into account possible changes, political changes in our neighboring countries. So we understood that we should take action in order to reduce the greenhouse emission. We understand now that further development of the economy without making it greener, uh, more sustainable, more safe, and more for people. For our country, it's quite a challenge because our economy is very labor-intensive. And in our country, the traditional energy methods like using coal are quite widespread. And therefore, working on the strategy for the future has shown that we have a great potential in reducing the um, dirty energy sources, such as coal. And so we are looking at various methods of carbon capture and storage. But this is not something we can do just now. It's more long-term future projects. When it comes to short-term plans, with up to 2030, there are things we can do to reduce the use of coal and in energy production. We developed a roadmap for each sector of economy, which would lead to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions up to 2030. We know that we can do it faster and achieve better results 
if we aim to achieve carbon neutrality sooner, but this would require greater investments, greater use of state-of-the-art technologies, and more investments. But in any case, next year we will complete our work and we will present our um, strategy to the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anir. Um, <coughs> lots of developments that you have, uh, and it's great to hear that you're working as well with others. And I'm very interested when you talk about the state of the art, the modeling technique, because sometimes it's hard to make decisions when you don't know where you are or where, you know, where the baseline is. Um, which, which leads me back to, to Carl, because it was great to hear about the roadmap of uh, what, what Kazakhstan is doing. But um, Carl, how could, how could we encourage then the private sector to stimulate market <coughs> responses to long-term strategies? And, and maybe what role does, does data play in, in all of this? Thank you, Margaret. Um, yeah, the market is effectively uh, you know, a, a massive collection of, of, on every second, economic decisions being made. Uh, and those decisions are made on the basis of data. Um, when we're specifically looking in terms of investment into uh, renewable energy, as we were talking about earlier, in, in emerging markets or uh, low-carbon technology into economies in transition, um, again, you know, it's, it's data. Um, and there's a lot of data out there, um, you know, in our own CAMCO clean energy world, we're, we're dealing with grid factors and uh, FX forward curves and, you know, country credit ratings and uh, average revenue per user for mini grids. And, you know, you, you can't go to an investor and would you like to do this project if you don't have a financial model, and that financial model is rigorous and built on good data. So data is key. It's almost trite to say that it's, it's key. Um, but I think just returning to the topic of the panel, what the long-term strategy process can do uh, is really build resilience and quality and transparency and strength into those data streams so that when businesses are making the risk return decision, they make better decisions. Uh, particularly in emerging markets, I think there is an asymmetry between perceived risk and real risk, and that asymmetry is caused by the lack of quality data. Uh, and you know we can empirically prove that there is an asymmetry of risk, because if you look at something like CEDAR's guarantee uh, uh, facility, uh, it's over-provisioned. You know, the, the projects that they are guaranteeing are simply not as risky as they thought that they were. Uh, now, that asymmetry is caused not only by the kind of lack of data, but also the lack of uh, transparency around the data, and the process by which a country like South Africa has gone through informing its, its long-term strategy gives people confidence. Uh, private sector, civil society, we can all build into those data streams, we can strengthen them, um, we can uh, suggest what's needed. I mean, we have a, a project for the Green Climate Fund, and um, that project is struggling because there isn't 30 years of climate data available. Um, you know, it's a very contentious matter at the board. But, you know, uh, yes, data is key, but I, I do think that the private sector will make good economic decisions when given quality data. And in this particular space, uh, I think we're all in agreement that those good decisions are decisions that generate mitigation ac outcomes, uh, provide adaptation finance, result in impact, uh, not, as mentioned earlier, out of any sort of altruism, but because of the pull factor that Harry was talking about, that these, these are just good economic decisions. Uh, but without good data, we can't make those good economic decisions. Thank you, Carl. Um, so I, I, I like this, this uh, vibe or this, this narrative of a pull factor. Um, and so I'd like to turn back to you, Mary, because you mentioned um, the emergence of a new energy economy in yours. So, so let's go back to you and how, how can clarity on long-term strategies accelerate the shift to this, to this new economy that you're, you, you reference? Well, I, I think it's really important in thinking ahead to, yeah, in terms of our long-term strategies to recognize that, uh, yeah, as, as I've indicated, that there really is a new 
uh, global energy economy um, emerging here. And um, it, it promises to be really quite different um, from what we have today. Um, uh, our modeling and, and scenarios, and I think what we're already seeing in terms of uh, investment um, trends and uh, related very much to our climate goals is that um, electricity by 2050 and 2050 is going to be um, taking an ever more central role. Um, no question there as uh, households rely on electricity and this form of energy to meet uh, everyday um, needs, um, mobility, cooking, lighting, heating, cooling, um, electricity um, meets around 50% of final energy use by our estimates by, uh, by uh, 2050, which is up significantly from around 20% um, today. And, um, and clean energy technologies become the first choice, as they already have in so many cases for consumers around the world, really become the areas for uh, 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 first uh, choice in areas for investment, also for international competition, really, quite frankly, as well. Um, solar PV and wind uh, um, are already uh, cheaper in many cases than fossil fuels in many parts of the world. And I think the case for electric vehicles um, is already quite um, compelling. And all of these trends will be even more true um, in the net zero uh, world in 2050 if we really all, uh, if the global community um, and economies, countries around the world really work um, very hard to meet and achieve those uh, 2050 goals. Um, we think there's a lot of opportunity in this new uh, energy um, economy and in markets going forward. If the world um, really gets on track for net zero by 2050, the cumulative market opportunity we estimate for wind turbines, solar panels, lithium iron batteries, electrolyzers, and fuel cells amounts to 27 trillion US dollars. So in these five um, equipment markets alone would be comparable to, to to the value of today's oil market um, by mid-century in terms of annual revenues. So really significant potential there. Um, on the job side, we estimate almost 30 million in new clean energy jobs um, are created in the net zero scenario to 2030, um, which is far higher than the jobs that are lost in the declining sectors. And these are the scenarios modeled on, on, uh, on, on the goals countries themselves have set for 2030 and 2050, very much, of course, linked to actual um, implementation. So looking ahead, um, we think it's really important that governments and the private sector companies accelerate actions to, to seize on these uh, upcoming and growing um, market opportunities. And, um, and I do think where long-term strategies um, can play, this catalyst can, can play a really important catalyst role by helping um, uh, us think about how to plan for this uh, new energy future and to really get investments moving on the ground now, very much sooner um, rather than later. Um, supported, of course, by the policy, uh, right kind of policy environments that have been um, so uh, well uh, mentioned um, to ensure that these projects are um, are well supported and, uh, and that the private sector is incentivized to um, invest in them and invest in the clean power efficiency and electrification that's going to be um, so, uh, so important. Um, and this also involves getting energy price signals and carbon markets right. So there's a lot to think about um, structurally uh, and in policy terms as well. And, um, and putting state-owned utilities uh, also on a firmer financial um, footing. So there, there are a lot of different pieces to all of this, we recognize, um, but we think there's great opportunity moving forward and that really now is the time to focus on how to scale up those investments, again, uh, motivated, stimulated by the right policy environment. Great, thank you, Mary. Um, with your examples on, on what you how you see the new energy economy and it's um, transformative to think we're going to go from 20% electricity to 50%. To but you mentioned one of the things you mentioned in there as well was a community. And, and so I, I'd actually like to move back to Anur because this notion of, um, you know, the international community, and it sounds like you've worked with a variety of, of other 
countries within your own region, but also externally and some developed countries. And, and could you share what, what the role of the international community in helping countries develop their long-term strategies is? Thank you for your question. I will speak in Russian. Um, um, Роль международных учреждений, организаций, финансовых учреждений, я думаю, довольно высока в достижении именно странами своих долгосрочных стратегий по достижению целей, части амбициозности их планов по сокращению выбросов парниковых газов. And the ambitions in achieving the reduction in greenhouse gas. All these ambitions require a lot of investment, but also a lot of knowledge in this area and the expert knowledge in how to organize and run projects on achieving the targets. Working with international organizations, we are aware of the massive experience that they have, which they can pass on to their partners. And we know that we know of a number of projects that um, helped our business, businesses within the country as to how to work with projects directed at the adaptation and reduction of greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gases. The potential within the country is not that high, and there are not that many experts who have experience in running projects like this. Therefore, international experts are crucial in helping us to in questions like uh, updating our laws and regulations, especially in the ecological sphere in protection of the nature and gas production and oil production. We recently had some recommendations issued by the experts for a number of joint projects in the energy sector. At the same time, we have some experience in other projects, which were done in cooperation with the International Bank, which helped us a lot with the development of the roadmap. In general, we see a big potential in collaboration with international financial organizations in order to achieve our goals. And I'm sure any single country would agree with me that on its own it's virtually impossible to achieve the goals. We can do so much more together. With, and I hope that the collaboration that we have will grow, and not just in terms of the meetings and events, but in the in the actual um, work. Thank you. Thank you, Anur. Um, very elegantly stated. Um, what you're looking for in really building the the case, the, the the business case, but the country case, the the, the social case for collaboration uh, among the international community. Um, and, and I'd like to pose one last final question to Harry, and then I'm going to open this up to the floor. And for those of you that are listening virtually, you can uh, type in your questions. Um, but Harry, I, I'd like this final question is, how can the, the MDBs support and facilitate the uptake of robust long-term strategies? I think, you know, I think I can give a fairly short answer. I mean, there are, there are four things that we can do, um, and many of them respond to the to the points that I know was making about you know the fact that this is a new world for for all of us really, and and it does need a lot of expertise. 
Um, one is that we, we have knowledge. Um, you know, we have we, we, we have resources ourselves uh, and we can bring advice and guidance. And we can also do that informed by the experience of many different countries. You know, MDBs are operating across many different countries. And it's really useful and, and, and often very insightful to be able to say, well, look, I had this problem. You know, we saw this problem come up in this other country two years ago, and this is how we solved it, or this is how we helped them solve it. Um, so I think that that element, that, that sort of ability to look across a whole range of countries and, and bring the experiences is useful. Um, we can bring technical support. Um, we are often, as you know, the administering agents for, for donor finance, which can be used to fund uh, technical support. I think our shareholders have made it very clear to us that they regard that as a very high priority for our activities. And, and that's one that certainly we at EBRD are expecting to scale up in the next few years. It's just the ability to deploy consultants to provide that sort of high level uh, support. Um, the third thing we can do is, is a play the sort of coordination and intermediary role. Um, you know, we are institutions that, that really sit at a nexus between governments, policymakers, civil society, investors, um, and I think particularly for EBRD, you know, we are a, a public bank, but 75% or more of our, of our business is in the private sector. What we really hope to bring to, to these discussions and to contribute is that ability to know what works for <laughs> investors, but also what, is, what meets the public aspiration and meets the public needs. Um, so we can play that intermediary, uh, honest broker role of making sure that what comes out of these processes, these discussions, <laughs> is, is both meeting the long-term <laughs> public goals, but at the same time is going to be something that really works for investors, delivers the, the, the environment which will then prompt them to make the investments that we all want them to, to be making. Um, so I think that's the third role. And then the fourth role is that we are ourselves investors. And, and I think the, you know, the, best, the best thing we can do in supporting long-term strategies and validating long-term strategies is to move forward with investments um, and to really link the work we do with a country to try to design a long-term strategy with very concrete investments, uh, supporting foreign investment, supporting employment, uh, supporting the transformation of infrastructure. So it's really those four things put together, the, the, the internal knowledge, the ability to access uh, in, uh, expert consultancy, the ability to play an intermediary role, and then fourth and, and, and finally to deploy our own balance sheet and, and to really make turn a long term help turn a long term strategy into facts on the ground and, and to a transformed economy. Thank you, Harry, for wrapping that up. Um, it's very uh, those four points are very key, um, and you're pointing out the fact that you know none of us can do this alone, and I think there's that deep expertise and knowledge that the multilateral development banks such as EBRD have at dealing boots on the ground um, uh, and developing projects and, and deciding on investments. Um, so thank you so much. I've really uh, enjoyed the discussion. It's very rich, uh, also very varied from different perspectives. It's great to have an, a, a, a country as well, Kazakhstan, um, here. I'd like to open up the floor if there's any questions. Um, I saw your hand first, if you want to come up to the gentleman. If you could just introduce yourself, your name, uh, where you're from, and your question. And maybe we'll take uh, two questions at the same time afterwards. Uh, yes, gentlemen. Yes, please. Thank you very much. My name is John Krause. I'm from a, a UK think and do tank called the Blockchain Climate Institute, uh, looking at distributed ledger technology. And we're, we're part of the CTCN, the UN network for uh, getting technology capacity building out to, to recipient countries in particular. Um, a lot of what was said was around how you get reliable data, how you store those data, how you make sure they can't be um, interfered with, if you like, how you know they're trustworthy. Uh, and then I think also a lot about um, how you can make investment uh, more frictionless. Um, and a way of doing that, of course, is through things like smart contracts, which blockchain is a way of achieving all of those things or any other form of distributed ledger technology would do the same thing. So I just wondered to what extent the panelists um, have looked at distributed ledger technology, in particular blockchain, in trying to ease the investment flows into projects and increase MRV, for example. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. And uh, the gentleman who came up, yes, thank you. Could you please introduce yourself and your the company you're from or, or association? Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Marek. I work with the International Labour Organization. I think it's all too, too nice. Um, the question of finance um, and the return on investment, I think that's solved uh, some time ago. I think no one would 
invest in the coal anymore. No, I think 95% is now state-owned companies. But I think um, where we see the private sector has main challenges, I agree with a colleague from the private sector, uh, these are technical questions, no? uh, more or less. But the main question, I believe, is energy security in India and China and the reason why they want still to exploit um, their coal resources as well as um, Arab states uh, interested in exploiting their oil reserves which come for free basically off the ground with very much drilling costs. So I think to solve the climate deadlock um, and, and I think from the International Energy Agency in particular to reach that goal, I mean, I would say we solve the private sector and, and, and yes, that's ongoing and I see progress on that, but I don't see much progress on the financial side, how we can allow the finance sector of state-owned companies and governments to move in the same direction. Thank you. So, sorry, sorry, so, so the, the question for the panel is how to solve the financial progress on the financial side? Is that, is that what you... If there's, the question is precisely this, is there, are we talking on the sidelines of the event here on finance, or is there a different question on finance, um, which is not finance, but the political economy, where whatever we do on the financial side, we just say, okay, in India, uh, the last bit I've read is 0.01 US cent per kilowatt hour, which is just crazy in terms of how low the cost is of wind, or I think was a PV plant. Um, so everyone would go for it, obviously. You know. Okay. But but the but 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 the Indian state just announced 2070 as a phase out, uh, and they still want to exploit their their, their coal reserves. You know? so the question is, are we dealing with a financial question here, or is it no longer a financial question? But the financial question is solved. But now we need to move on to other things. You know? that, okay. That's the, the key point. Oh, okay. Thank you, Marek. I, I don't think the financial question is solved. But let's move maybe to some of some of the panelists. So we've had two questions so far. The first one was from John with regards to blockchain. Um, has anybody? Uh, does it, you would you like? Yeah. I can I can have a go if the mic's on. Um, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I have very little understanding of blockchain. I can basically not really work Excel. Uh, but we do have projects that are using artificial intelligence, blockchain, uh, new ways of disassembling data to answer fairly standard, ordinary commercial questions like where should I put my mini grid or who should I lease my solar home system to? Uh, so, you know, yes, I see a bit of that in the renewable energy sector arguably not enough of it, um, uh, but it is, uh, it is out there and, and we're hoping to actually present a project to the Green Climate Fund um, that would be very innovative in the, its use of data uh, to, to generate uh, off-grid electricity and electrification for, for, for people. So yeah, it, it's out there, um, should be more of it, sure. Uh, and then on the second question, if I can have a kind of go at that. This is, uh, you know, a collective action problem. Climate is a collective action problem. I've been going to COP since 2006. Uh, you are always going to have difficulties with certain actors um, because their drivers are not purely uh, the climate emergency, like was said, you know, energy security or energy competition in the case of, of <coughs> some of them. Um, how do we solve that? Um, you know, I think perseverance, um, and to a large degree, I think science is solving that for us because, um, you know, there are certain countries that have very low costs of extracting oil that are going to become fairly uninhabitable <laughs> fairly soon. So, um, no, I, I don't think this process has ever been a financial process. This process has always been a political process. Mary, do you have anything that you wanted to? Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to add to um, what well, was just said with respect to um, you know China and India and the importance of our 
ongoing engagement, um, you know, with major um, energy and emissions um, uh, countries around the world. Um, uh, there's no question uh, that uh, there's been significant dialogue uh, with both of these countries, just as there has been with many of the other major emitters. Um, is there more uh, room for progress? Is there more that needs to be done? I think that can be said for uh, many countries around the world, which is why it's important from our perspective <coughs> in the International Energy Agency um, that we re remain in dialogue with them, that we continue to press for um, you know, higher ambition wherever possible. Um, we, uh, we've worked very closely with both of those countries in particular and um, certainly welcome the commitments that have been, uh, been made thus far. And we also recognize, as we have been emphasizing very much in our recent reporting, that uh, uh, while um, you know, long-term ambition is really important, what's also incredibly important is the sort of short-term plans for action and implementation, um, which is why the focus on 2030 for us is, is, is terribly important too. Um, with China, we've worked quite closely, and we have with other countries um, on, on looking at roadmaps to, if not net zero, carbon neutrality, um, however that's best um, defined. And at China's request, we um, launched, released um, earlier this year, um, in collaboration with them, a roadmap to 2060 um, to help outline some of the pathways forward. Um, does it necessarily, you know, address all the financing issues? No, but it does lay out the potential policy pathways. And similarly with India, we've been under, under discussions there too. How can, uh, how can countries, uh, you know, get to where it is that they want to go? And we recognize there are different starting points and different pathways forward, um, but identifying um, the ambition is certainly a good start um, and really important to keep pressing on. We've been in discussions with Indonesia as well, which expressed, has expressed a strong interest in, in IEA expertise on this area of, road, of, of developing a roadmap uh, forward. So um, we, um, we think, as I said, that it's really important um, to con continue to stay engaged uh, on the policy um, pathways, again, to realizing um, each, each country's um, goals. <coughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know if Harry you had anything or Anur. Я думаю, я воздержусь от комментариев в части криптовалют, поскольку это не совсем моя сфера деятельности. I would like to say that this is a sensitive issue for many countries. And in particular, if we speak about Kazakhstan, we are developing measures to encourage the demand for other types of energy, for environmentally safe energies and other technologies. We are updating our regulations in relation to renewables in order to reduce emissions and pollution. We uh, develop various encouragement measures for those industries who develop environmentally safe technologies and use them. And at present, um, our carbon trading um, is uh, facing towards the reduction of emissions. We are going to improve it in future. It includes uh, um, the fines for CO2 emissions and the distribution of that. I believe that um, prices for carbon would result in higher price for other sources of energy, for the renewables, for low carbon, for low carbon sources. Thank you. Now, Harry, I don't know if you had anything to add. I know we're almost close to time, but I know that uh, EOBD has a, probably a very... <laughs> we can't hear you, Harry. Sorry. Uh, I can't, we can't hear you, sorry. Okay. Um, well, I, I guess... 
Uh, yeah, I guess, um, sorry, Harry, we, we can't hear you. I guess we're going to wrap this up because we need to um, stay on, on time, on, on top of uh, time and everything. I would thank you so much for, for the panelists. We really appreciate this. I think there's really three key takeaways that I heard from this. One is there's various pathways. Um, you know, the goal of carbon neutrality is the same, but the pathway to get to carbon neutrality is different, and, and the work that IEA is, is, is doing is instrumental to, to helping people to, to develop or countries and organizations develop long-term pathways. Um, those that can go further and faster should do so, and they are. The second key takeaway I would take is innovation. We need um, you know, new business models, new technologies. We've got Mary into, into an, a new energy system. And then the third is really engagement. We've, we've, uh, efforts alone by people staying or countries in their silos are, are not uh, conducive. We need the international community. We need to, to, to go together and to, to build on this. We're at time. Thank you so much for those of you that joined us here. We really appreciate it. Um, and back over to you. Thank you. <laughs>